an evening of unbridled fun for families and youngsters at Sydney's Luna Park comes to a fiery end when seven people lose their lives in a devastating inferno. Soon, shocking allegations of police corruption, arson, and organized crime follow. Now, more than 40 years later, authorities hope a $1 million reward will help families find answers to the haunting mystery of what really happened on that night in 1979. Sydney's Luna Park, with its fantasy architecture, has been operational since 1935. Thousands of families have made lifelong memories inside the Art Deco-style themed attraction with its gaping mouth gates. But in June 1979, an incident changed that perception after a father, his two sons, and four primary school friends were killed on the park's most popular ride. The ghost train was one of the highlights of the venue. The two and a half minute long ride snaked through a maze of dark tunnels where imitation ghouls and beasts were hiding around every twist and turn. It seated two people in cars shaped like little train engines, transporting riders through 600 feet of electric track filled with frightening scenes, hairpin bends, and an imitation fire. Just after 10 p.m. on the night of June 9th, however, some riders noticed real flames coming from the imitation fire scene about three quarters of the way into the ride. Thinking it was part of the adventure, they decided against reporting it. Five best friends from Waverly were looking forward to the scary ghost train. It was their first evening out alone without the escort of their families, and the teen boys were having the time of their lives. They had no clue that only one of them would leave the park alive. According to survivor Jason Holman, his four friends boarded the two carriages in front of him. He sat alone in the next one and said that although they were excited, the boys were also a little nervous about the ride. More than 30 other riders were also in their cars, getting ready for the ghoulish experience. Holman watched as his friend's cars entered the swinging entrance doors marked Hell's Doorway. But as his car made its way to the entrance, he was ripped out of the ride by one of the park attendants. Initially, Holman didn't see any signs of a blaze. He was bewildered by the attendant who yanked him out of the moving cart. Moments later, he saw the smoke billowing out from the entrance. And then, the screaming began. With no sprinklers to slow it down, the fire spread quickly. Soon, riders were trapped in darkness as the smoke and flames engulfed the ghost train. Passengers stumbled out from the ride structure, while some kicked at the partition walls, desperate to find a way out of the fiery maze. As Holman watched the scenes of mayhem and flames unfold, he saw soot-covered passengers emerging from the ride. But what happened next would be replayed in his mind's eye ever since. Flaming empty carriages exiting the ride on the mechanical track. His four friends were nowhere to be seen. Standing next to Holman was a grief-stricken woman with a dripping ice cream cone. It would later come to light that the woman was Jenny Godson. Godson, her husband and two kids traveled from Warren on a family holiday. It was the first time their children, aged two and four, visited the coast, and they were enjoying their time at the amusement park. At the end of the evening, the family still had four ride tickets left, and the boys decided to blow it on the ghost train. As they headed for the ride, Godson was overcome with what she called a bizarre craving for ice cream, which she usually didn't eat. She told her family to go ahead and wait for her at the entrance to the ride while she grabbed a cone. Little did she know, that it would be the last time she would see her family alive. I was from the country. I came down here to share a, a night with my family and my whole world just sort of fell to pieces. As she made her way back to the ghost train, she saw smoke pouring out of the ride, but her sons and husband were missing. Meanwhile, survivors recounted their car being surrounded by flames as high as 13 feet when they reached the exit. It, the place just went up. It just, people in it and all, just flames were just gushing out and, and smoke heavy. Like Frank and I were choking just about, even now, and I can't breathe properly because the smoke's still in my lungs. It just, it, the place just went up. Luna Park staff braved the burning inferno and heavy smoke, running inside to usher people out of the dark maze. 
Staff had initially thought that all the riders had made it out alive, but the empty cars emerging from the train tunnel told a different story. Emergency services raced to the scene, but due to inadequate water supply at the park, they were forced to source water directly from the harbor, which hampered their firefighting efforts. When the fire was finally extinguished at around 11.30 p.m., rescuers made the gruesome discovery. The remains of Godson's family were found huddled together in a dark tunnel. The bodies of the four friends from Waverly were uncovered in another section of the ride. They were just 13 years old. Hours later, the lead investigator of the fire, Detective Inspector Doug Knight, shut down any arson theories. We're now satisfied that the fire was as a result of an electrical fault within the building. Inspector Knight had ordered the demolition and cleaning up of the ghost train site and oversaw the destruction of the remaining rubble. Less than half a day after the fire was extinguished, it was bulldozed and the ruins removed. The rapid clearing of the site flies in the face of police procedure, which should have seen the area cordoned off after the bodies were removed to preserve evidence from being destroyed or contaminated. Two days after the tragedy, a victim's mother visited the scene of her son's death to lay a flower at the site. According to her, there was no crime scene tape or even officers on the scene. She thought it very unusual that the only thing left of the ghost train was the floor. But even so, the police narrative remained resolute that an electrical fault indeed caused the fire. Luna Park closed its doors for three years after the fire and opened up again under new management in 1982. For many, though, the idea that an electrical fault caused the fire simply did not ring true. But why were they so adamant it was arson? In 1977, two years before the fatal incident, the fire brigade warned Luna Park authorities of the risks posed by the ghost train's wooden tunnel. The concern was that it wasn't fitted with emergency lights or exit signs. The park also failed to heed a warning to install a sprinkler system and add a hose reel inside the ride. By May 1979, fire protective measures had still not been implemented and operators were given another 12 months to effect the necessary changes. The blaze broke out weeks later. According to a fire inspector who reviewed the train in 1977, the ride's interior was a complete maze, with black painted timber making it challenging to see even when the lights were on. He said he could only navigate his way out of the labyrinth by following the railway track. Nine weeks after the blaze, a coronial inquest speculated that a discarded cigarette butt, lack of lighting, signage, and the dark labyrinth-like tunnels all contributed to the tragedy. At the end of his investigation, the coroner found that Luna Park had failed in its duty of care to patrons, but not to the extent to support a charge of criminal negligence. The inquiry found that the seven deaths were caused by carbon monoxide poisoning and burns, but that the deaths were ultimately accidental. It would later unfold that there was no evidence to support that suggestion. According to reports, there were several no-smoking signs on the ride. On top of that, no passengers had seen or smelled cigarette smoke that evening. Eight years later, in 1987, the National Crime Authority opened another investigation into the tragedy. But while no new evidence surfaced, authorities found the previous investigations were inadequate and ineffective. It would take another 34 years before the families of the victims would get some concrete answers to what happened on that evening in 1979. Journalist Carl Meldrum Hanna uncovered a treasure trove of serious flaws in the way police handled the investigation. It included missing witness statements, the irregular cleaning of the fire scene, as well as the involvement of shady, underworld characters. Her research was backed up and supported with previously unseen documents and recorded interviews by artist Martin Sharp. Sharp, who was responsible for repainting the iconic Luna Park laughing face, never believed the fire was an accident. Several witnesses had told police they smelled highly flammable kerosene a type of paraffin near the imitation fireplace inside the ride, which was reportedly the ignition point of the inferno. But these reports were never investigated by police. 
Witnesses also mentioned a group of nefarious-looking men dressed like bikers, or bikies, in the vicinity of the ghost train around the time of the fire. Les Dowd, a teenager at the time, told police that he overheard a group of denim-clad bikies talking about spreading kerosene out and lighting it with a match. According to Dowd, he heard one of them say, quote, you're a fool for doing it, and started running towards the exit. The numerous witnesses, however, say they had felt pressured or even bullied by police to follow a different narrative from what they had seen that night. Even more sinister are the claims of police corruption which implicated the lead investigator Doug Knight with organized crime syndicates. It's believed Knight was a so-called fixer who would take money from criminals to manipulate investigations. In fact, newly uncovered reports from senior New South Wales police officers alleging that crime boss Abe Saffron, or Mr. Sin as he was known, personally ordered the ghost train fire. His motive for the arson? Prime waterfront real estate. These claims would further develop when, after the fire, Luna Park was sold to a rather dubious tender with family links to Saffron. Further investigations showed that arson had been Mr. Sin's weapon of choice when it came to attacks on business properties he wanted to acquire for himself, and Doug Knight, as his fixer, allowed him to get away with murder. Saffron died in 2006, but a year after his death, his niece revealed to the Sydney Morning Herald that her uncle was responsible for the ghost train fire, but that no one was supposed to die. The fire, she said, was set to gain control of the park lease for himself. A day after the interview, the niece demanded that the story not be published. She would later deny making the revelations attributed to her, even though the interview had been recorded. In April 2021, the state coroner formally requested the New South Wales police authorities to review all the evidence concerning the cause and origin of the fire, as well as the circumstances surrounding the resulting deaths. Then, in July 2021, the police minister announced that the investigation would be reopened and gave people one million reasons to come forward with new information. Uh, I'm delighted that the government has seen fit to offer a $1 million reward. It is appropriate given the public interest in this investigation. Um, uh, uh, the passage of time has made it just that little bit more difficult for us to get evidence and that's why I'm appealing to members of the public if they know anything, even if they think that they've passed it on, please come back to the New South Wales Police and offer up any information they believe may be related to this incident. Families of the victims have welcomed the reopening of investigations, hoping that fresh leads could help them find the closure they so badly need. But after more than four decades, it's discouraging to think of all the possible evidence and witness statements lost due to corruption at the highest levels, and how a system meant to protect failed the seven victims. Today, a refurbished ghost train still runs at Luna Park. Before we wrap up today's episode, I want to give you a sneak peek into next week's documentary. Trust me, you won't want to miss it. Imagine setting sail on the vacation of your dreams, only for it to turn into a nightmare at sea. It's a disaster that left passengers stranded, desperate, and in unimaginable conditions. While working on this episode, I want to thank Skillshare, our sponsor. You know, an online learning community with thousands of classes in creative and entrepreneurial skills. So I recently took Jordi Vandeput's video editing classes, and the storytelling and editing tricks I've learned have been a total game changer. Discover your passion with classes on photography, animation, or music. Get things done with courses on productivity and organization. The first 1,000 people to use my link in the description will get one free month of Skillshare. Plus, you can get 30% off annual memberships using the code ANNUAL30AFF. Watch this episode next if you found this video interesting. Please add a like and leave a comment if you want to support the channel.